now. Great. Um, uh, before we get started, I just wanted to ask for the third exhibition, Don, Amy, and Gerard, uh, which one of you is going to be doing the screen share? It'll be Gerard. Gerard, who's muted. <laughs> Great. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Terry Beswick. I'm the executive director of the GLBT Historical Society. And today's event is called uh, Curating with Pride. Um, and uh, it's being recorded and will be posted to our website. Many people are joining us now on Zoom and others will be watching on Facebook live stream. If you are watching with us on Zoom, we welcome your active participation in the forum, please. Uh, if you uh, hover your mouse down at the bottom there and you're on Zoom, you, you can uh, post comments in the uh, chat box function by clicking on the chat. Um, and you can post uh, questions for us in the Q&A box. Um, we may not get to the questions uh, right away. We're gonna probably get to a lot of those towards the end of today's forum, which we're expecting will run between an hour and a half and two hours. Uh, so just briefly, I want to describe the hosting organization. Uh, the GLBT Historical Society was founded in 1985. We're recognized internationally as a leader in the field of LGBTQ public history. Our mission is to collect, preserve, and exhibit and make accessible to the public materials and knowledge to support and promote understanding of LGBTQ history, culture, and arts in all their diversity. So. Under normal circumstances, our operations are cent centered around two physical sites, the GLVT Historical Society Museum, located since 2011 in the heart of the San Francisco Castro neighborhood, and the John P. DeCecco Archives and Research Center, open to researchers in the mid-market district. And then, although our physical locations are expected to remain closed through at least mid-August, please check out our Pride Month webpage, which includes a wide variety of exhibitions, events, and archival resources at glbthistory.org. And while you are there, please consider becoming a member of the Historical Society. We are running a special for Pride Month, and until the end of June, you can get an annual membership with some cool perks for just $35, $20 for low income. Take pride in your history. Our history connects us even when we're apart. So, with that, let's move on to curating with pride. So the GLBT Historical Society currently has three pride-related exhibitions mounted on our website, which we'll be examining today. First, uh, Performance, Protest, and Politics, The Art of Gilbert Baker, curated by Jeremy Prince and Joanna Black. Second, uh, the 50 Years of Pride exhibition curated by Lenora Chin and Pamela Penniston for the Society in collaboration with the San Francisco Arts Commission. And finally, Labor of Love, The Birth of San Francisco Pride, 1970 through 1980, which just opened this last week, curated by Gerard Koskovich, Don Romsberg, and Amy Siyoshi. So today we're delighted to bring together curators from each of the three exhibitions, including Jeremy, Lenora, Amy, Don, and Gerard to discuss their curatorial approaches and selected images and content. Using different sections of the online exhibitions as a guide, you will discuss the themes they selected, the curatorial lenses that informed their work, and consider both the history and perhaps the future of pride. Uh, let's see, so this afternoon we're gonna be looking through each of the three exhibitions in the sequence that they launched on our website and hear from the curators in turn. And following this, we'll have a more open conversation with all the curators together to talk about the common thing, themes in each of their work and also to take any questions from uh, the audience participating on Zoom. Uh, did we lose, no, there he is. Hi, Jeremy. <laughs> First, we'll hear from Jeremy Prince, who along with jo Joanna Black curated performance, protest, and politics, the art of Gilbert Baker. This exciting exhibition uses textiles, costumes, photographs, and ephemera to paint a complex portrait of artist Gilbert Baker, 1951 to 2017, who designed the iconic rainbow flag. So Jeremy Prince is the collection, he uh, until recently was the collection specialist at the San Diego History Center. He began volunteering at the newly opened GLBT Historical Society Museum in 2011. From 2014 to 2019, we were honored to have him as the Society's Director of Exhibitions and Museum Operations. 
Prince holds an MA in early European, early modern European history and museum studies from, the, from San Francisco State University. So with that, I'm gonna turn over the reins to Jeremy, mute myself and sit back and watch, listen. Thank you, Jeremy, for being here. Well, thank you and congrats to you, Terry, for becoming uh, the community grand marshal this year for Pride. Um, so thank you. I, my my boyfriend and I are joking that we're going to do a cardboard cutout of a of a convertible and ride it around my living room by video. So uh, if I can talk him into it, right? Making do, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah. So I'm Jeremy Prince. I was up until last year the direction uh, the director of exhibitions and museum operations at the GLBT Historical Society, and along with Joanna Black, who uh, as a few years ago, was the director of archives at the GLBT Historical Society. Uh, the exhibition Performance Politics and, uh, sorry, Performance Protests and Politics, The Art of Gilbert Baker, grew out of the Gilbert Baker estate. Uh, Gilbert uh, passed away suddenly in 2017, and Joanna, as the archivist, went to New York to his apartment to gather some of his, his belongings, some of his art, some of his costumes, uh, manuscript materials, photos, et cetera. And we really, we spent this summer processing the collection. There was, there was an amazing array of everything and uh, Joanna and I both decided that it was a very timely moment to do an exhibit about Gilbert Baker. Uh, we decided not really to do a retrospective of his life uh, but when we were talking with the, uh, the Gober Baker estate and specifically um, Charlie Beale, we heard that uh, they were going to posthumously publish Gilbert Baker's memoir. Uh, Joanna had, got, had, had, had picked up a lot of different manuscripts that Gilbert had written from the 90s all the way to a little more recently and Charlie had a few external hard drives with different copies. So uh, the result was this book, uh, Rainbow Warriors, My Life in Color by Gilbert Baker. And this really was the, the crux of the exhibit. And we did a lot of our exhibition, or a lot of our curatorial work around this book. Uh, Joanne and I decided that we wanted to do an exhibit that used Gilbert Baker's textiles, his art, all of his creations, but also we wanted to use Gilbert Baker's voice. So where and when we could, we let the book guide how the curatorial process went. Uh, so the, the three big themes that we came up with were performance, protest, and politics. And those were the lenses that we looked through Gilbert Baker's life. Uh, so let me share the screen, my screen here, one second. Oh, uh, Oh, wait. Uh, well, maybe we don't get audio. Um, let's see. Let me see if I know what the password is. I guess I didn't foresee that technical difficulty. Is it? Okay, well, I guess we won't be doing audio. Um, okay, well, let's see. So yeah, so the online exhibit, I think turned out amazing. I'm actually, I'm really proud of Nalini and the staff for how this came together. It, it's beautiful. Um, the exhibit technically is still up at the museum, I guess, until August, um, but no one will be able to see it. Um, so uh, I was going to start with this here. Community. I lived in San Francisco in, in 1970. Can everyone hear it this? Incredible place okay. to be. It was a time of incredible empowerment and, and political organizing and community building and artistic expression. Really, up until the rainbow flag, the pink triangle was the dominant symbol that we used. Um, and but it came from the Nazis. It was put on us. And, you know, it had a really horrible uh, negative origin about murder and Holocaust. I didn't even think twice about what the flag would be. A rainbow fit us. It is from nature. It connects us to all the colors, all the colors of sexuality, all the diversity in our community. 
the original flag had eight colors, you know, the, the pink for sex, red for life, orange for healing, yellow for sun, green for nature, turquoise for magic, blue for serenity, and purple for the spirit. This was the, the hippie 1978 meanings for the thing. Gilbert and... Oh, yeah. So we, you know, as, as I said, we tried using Gilbert Baker's voice when and where we could. Um, and I think Gilbert explains it perfectly, the history of the flag. I won't go too much in the background of Pride in the 70s. Uh, I'll save that for Don, Gerard, and Amy. Uh, but in 1978, Gilbert Baker and others create two flags uh, for the, the Gay Freedom Day Parade. And let's see move this over here. Uh, so one of them is kind of a mix of the eight color rainbow flag and the American flag. The next one is uh, just the eight colors uh, that you see here. And there was only two of them and they were just, they were wildly popular. And so the next year Gilbert Baker created tons of them to go up and down Market Street. And really that, that first rainbow flag, as he was saying, you know, they, everyone wanted a new symbol because at the time you had the pink triangle, which was a symbol uh, from the Nazis that was put on us. And, you know, it was time for a new symbol. There's a new generation. And so the rainbow flag uh, was the creation and it's kind of stuck ever since, and it's really the, the symbol of LGBT people uh, worldwide. Um, so, you know, we, we did a little bit about the flag, and I don't think, no, the, there's one more flag that's in the exhibit that I don't have a photo of, but that was a nine color flag uh, that was done right before Gilbert Baker passed away, and that was a diversity flag. You know, Gilbert always, thought the flag had different meetings for different people. And as time went on, I mean, the pink and the, the turquoise were cut in 1979 for the sheer fact that uh, they were too expensive. Hot pink, very expensive to make. It wasn't easy to get. So that got cut out. Turquoise, you know, well, they, you know, not eight, nine, well, sorry. Seven, sorry, seven colors wasn't a good idea. It wasn't symmetrical. So turquoise got uh, kicked off the flag. And so we see the six color flag as most people know it now. Um, so to fast forward in the exhibit, uh, one of the other themes that we looked at was using the rainbow flag um, as just a huge statement in the 25th anniversary of Pride in New York City in 19, um, 1994. It was the 25th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots and uh, Gilbert Baker was commissioned by Cleve Jones to, uh, to put together a whole mile long flag. And they were, they were hoping to go down Fifth Ave as they normally would go down but uh, the city and the church, Giuliani and the church and everyone, decided that it was going to go down First Ave instead. Uh, but Gilbert and other activists uh, did not agree with what the city was saying. So um, I'm going to read a little from the memoir here to put this into uh, Gilbert's own words. Uh, so they, well, they were going down First, uh, first Ave, but they were planning on doing this little side protest to actually go past uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral. So um, you'll see here, I'll try to zoom in. It's really, it's really hard to see this unless, unless you know what to look for. But here in this, this is going down first. But as you come down the photo, it starts to get snipped right here. So this whole mile long flag, Gilbert Baker decides to cut into pieces and do this uh, extra little protest march. Okay, so <clears throat> Gilbert says, I kept running until I made my way up to the front of the flag at, uh, at 56th Street, then pulled out my Fiskars. I had finally come to the climax of the performance, a magician, a mile of scarf and a pair of scissors. 
Uh, he goes on, uh, then he gets in, a, he gets in a, ta a taxi and, you know, has to go to the new meeting spot. Uh, in a New York minute, we are in a cab and telling the driver to step on it. Down to the 20s, right, then left on Madison Ave, heading uptown to 40th Street and 5th Ave. When we arrived at the New York Public Library, the cabbie popped the truck, the trunk, and we seized the twisted mess of fabric with all our might. The heavy load felt good. We felt strong. The four of us reached the center of Fifth Ave, where the lines of the crosswalk intersected with the, the traditional lavender stripes painted down Fifth every June, an annual ritual that took place the night before the parade. Uh, he continues. Um, let's see down here. So then they get up to St. Patrick's Cathedral. Uh, God's temple was blocked with a row with row after row of wooden barricades. An elaborate security detail completely sealed off the church from the public. High up in the spires, sharpshooters were poised. Out on the street, the boys in blue stood shoulder to shoulder, holding nightsticks. Their faces masked behind greasy plastic shields. I caught the eye of one man in uniform, sporting the biggest amount of gold braid and called out, what, no barbed wire? The territorial imperative was all for show. They weren't about to do anything. Um, a volley of protesters voice, uh, sorry, <clears throat> a volley of protester voices screamed towards the locked doors. You could hear it echo deeply in the Gothic bowels of the granite citadel. The cardinal would have, would have to cover his ears or else he would hear. The words were ringing from such force, with such force, they burned into my soul. For a second, I imagined the pretentious palace of faith crumbling into a subterranean hell. You can't stop us and you can't stop our flag, a new voice declared and goes on. So they use this flag in defiance of the city, of the church, and um, actually went into the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest flag, which was surpassed a few years later for the 30th anniversary of uh, the, the rainbow flag actually being created when it stretched from the Atlantic uh, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico in Key West. And this is a shot of the Key West Pride Parade in 2003. Um, I would say one of Gilbert Baker's biggest, um, most proud moments was actually meeting President Obama in, uh, in the White House during Pride and actually presenting this flag, the eight color flag to President Obama, which is now in the Obama Presidential Library. Um, I mean, the, the, the White House being lit up for Pride, I mean, all these things from, for, from Gilbert Baker's you know, perspective definitely were just touching. To, to think that the White House, and maybe, I mean, now, definitely not these days, but, you know, in 2016, the White House being lit up in the rainbow flag, uh, just, I mean, who would have thought, right? <clears throat> uh, then, you know, we go into some of his protests which he was a part of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. And, you know, if there's one thing the sisters do well is activism mixed with satire and humor. So Gilbert had a short stint uh, as a sister, uh, but he inevitably was uh, kicked out of the sisters for, for being a little too too much, I think. Uh, so, you know, with the sisters, we were taking a look at when Pope John Paul II visited San Francisco and the protest uh, around that. And one of the, the things, which I, I think was just classic, one of the things that, that Gilbert did was he went to City Hall and filed to be the official welcoming committee for the Pope. So anyone who, you know, would, would be selling those little like tchotchkes or gifts, uh, Gilbert Baker and the sisters were actually the ones that had the official right as the, uh, uh, as the official welcoming committee. Um, one of the other just great little tidbits of Gilbert Baker that combined 
activism, protest, and politics uh, is the, the year in 1990 when he dressed as Pink Jesus during Pride. Uh, and I'm gonna read a little bit about that. Um, but then I have someone else that's gonna kind of put her, her story to this too in a second. Um, <clears throat> So Gilbert says, <clears throat> in 1990, I crashed the San Francisco Lesbian and Gay Freedom Day Parade. I did it dressed as Jesus Christ, covered head to toe in pink. Pink Jesus was a protest of many things I was pissed off about. I was protesting Senator Jesse Helms, a North Carolina homophobe, trying to kill the National Endowment for the Arts because of its support of gay art. Our First Amendment rights were under fire. I was also fed up with the Freedom Day organizers who controlled every aspect of the event. They had grown more conservative, asking drag kings, uh, sorry, drag and leather marchers to cool it. More censors, sorry, more censorship. I mean, yeah, to to ask drag queen and leather marchers to cool it is, yeah, right. Uh, Senator Helms was running for re-election in November of 1990. And recently the Miller Brewing Company had exposed for contributing, oh, uh, sorry, had been exposed for contributing money to his campaign. The news sparked boycotts of Miller beer and gay bars across America, but the parade bigwigs had decided to ignore the national protests and accepted $30,000 in Miller sponsorship money. So what, uh, what Gilbert Baker, Scarlet Harlot here, and then si uh, sister Sadie, Sadie the rabbi lady, decided to do was to crash pride both in protest of Senator Helms and of the pride committee itself. And I have a little, This is Scarlet Harlot explaining it to It's like a cartoon. It's like a living political cartoon. I'm trying to stop them. Be gone! Be gone! Be gone! The, the project that Gilbert created that inspired me the most and, and made me laugh the most was Pink Jesus. We all dressed up in sort of matching outfit. It was Sadie and Gilbert and I, and we waited in the corner and hid for when the parade would pass and nobody knew what we were gonna do and we knew that they would be a little bit mad and we were hoping oh, to get, as Gilbert would always say, fresh. Parade was coming our way, and we ran out right in front of the entire parade. And I pulled down my blouse and exposed myself. And Gilbert was was on the cross of Saint Jesus, martyrs for art. Oh, and there was nothing anybody could do about it. We made quite a splash. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, Gilbert was known for being outrageous, being outspoken, and you know, combining his passion of, of activism with his passion for art, his passion for sewing. And that is, you know, one of the, the big things that Joanna and I were trying to bring forth in the exhibition. And let's see. Uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, but, you know, we also in the exhibition have a few of his drag personas. So uh, we had a bit about Pink Jesus, but then some of his sewn pieces, we have his Lady Liberty outfit, uh, a Betsy Ross one, um, a, a Busty Ross, I should actually say. Um, it took us, well, it took us a while to stuff this dress because he, he I mean, go big or go home, I guess. Um, but then we have different photos of Gilbert throughout the years doing protests, glamour shots. Uh, the, the first annual, I guess it's hard to see this one, uh, but the first annual, not the dyke march, but the, um, what's it, the drag march in, in New York City in 1994. Okay. 
Uh, the last piece I want to show is one of his, actually one of his last pieces that he made before he passed away. Uh, so in 2016 with the, the presidential election and everything that Gilbert Baker first saw coming down the road after the election, Gilbert Baker produced these uh, Holocaust uniforms and as he presented them, like in this photo here, they're, they're pressed, they have the little bags on them that you would get from the cleaners. Uh, and Gilbert Baker says in an interview with the Castro Courier that was posthumously published, uh, <clears throat> you choose not to wear the uniforms of the oppressor. No one should wear them, only look at them. They're empty, perfect, ready and waiting, just like this horror show of a presidency is waiting to do God knows what. Um, and, you know, fast forward three years later from that interview, and they definitely are very, very timely. Um, one of the, the last things, let's see. Un oh, stop. Okay, there we go. Uh, one of the... The last little things I want to just bring up is uh, one of the, you know one of the things we weren't able to put into the exhibit for its sheer size was uh, this banner that Cleve Jones has that um, if you've been in any protests in the last few years in San Francisco you probably have read and seen the Rise and Resist uh, banner. I know there's an amazing photo of Alex U. Wynn, uh, the drag king during Pride of, I want to say, 2018 with it that Lenore Chin took. Um, and it's been used in countless protests in the Castro and, and beyond. But Gilbert Baker had a lot of different banners. I mean, he was a seamstress. He did his drag. He did his, his flags. But he also created a lot of banners um, in solidarity with different communities. I mean, there was one that Republican hate kills. Uh, there's another one, Don't Buy Trump's Lies. He had few in solidarity of and, uh, and against um, anti-LGBT laws in, in Russia. So, you know, Gilbert's ba Gilbert Baker's legacy really is about using your art as activism when and where you can and being that voice, not just for yourself, but for other communities. And the rainbow really symbolizes the, the big umbrella that we all are under of LGBT and it, it brings in all the colors of, of the rainbow because as a community you know, we all are very diverse we all you know are in that rainbow that he created even though it changes as time goes on thank you back to you Terry Great, thank you so much, Jeremy. It's really wonderful to uh, see this exhibition uh, and hear you talking about it. And I'm sorry that Joe jo couldn't be with us uh, today also to share uh, her perspective. Um, and I just wanna like call out and remind everyone that uh, Nalini Elias, our, our uh, 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 director of, of exhibitions at the museum, uh, quickly took the physical exhibition and transposed it into an online exhibition uh, much more quickly than, than what we had anticipated doing uh, in order to accommodate uh, the visitors who cannot go to the museum. And so I just want to call out and thank uh, Nalini for her work on that, as well as the upcoming two ex exhibitions that we're going to talk about. And Jeremy, I'm sure we'll uh, bring you back into the conversation after we go through the next, uh, next two and get more of your perspectives on all of this. Um, we kind of like threw the Gilbert Baker into the rubric of uh, pride activations. I think it fits in very nicely, especially with the pride flag being such a core piece of that uh, exhibition. Uh, but this, the second uh, that we have focusing on pride in particular, I think Lenore, are you ready to join us with a little presentation? Um, uh, for our next exhibition, we're gonna take a look at uh, 50 Years of Pride, which was curated by Lenore Chin and Pamela Penniston 
Uh, this is a photography exhibition, which was set to open uh, this month at San Francisco City Hall, and of course is instead online, documents the evolution of San Francisco Pride, the event that most powerfully represents and celebrates the Bay Area's LGBTQ community over the past half century. So Lenore Chin is going to join us now. Uh, Lenore is a painter, photographer, and cultural activist who works to create structures of personal and institutional support that both sustain critical artistic production and advance movements for social justice. Portraiture, both in painting and photography, is at the core of her visual art practice. Her current street photog photography chronicles a rapidly changing socio-political landscape. San Francisco native, she was a founding member of Lesbians and the Visual Arts, a co-founder of the Queer Cultural Center, and has been active in the Asian American Women Artists Association since the group was, was founded. And with that, uh, Lenore, if you're ready to go, you can unmute yourself and uh, show us what, and uh, tell us what you want to show and tell us. Okay, um, I thought I'd start out with the image that Pam and I picked uh, by Rick Gerharder which is a shot of the Civic Center Plaza uh, that he was able to capture from the, um, the dome at City Hall, right across the way there. And it just shows how dense that, um, you know, uh, festival was. It, th this would be, of course, as, as we would know, the, the end of the parade where all the contingents start to, you know, veer off and then the, the party in the Civic Center area happens and as so it's it's really huge of course you look back now i mean you know when you think of it we could never do this you know because they're just i don't know thousands of people that have shown up um and this was taken let me see let me double check uh this was taken in 2008 so what we had planned to do um with this exhibit, and I'll get more into, you know, how we envisioned this, was uh, as you descend the steps into that lower sort of basement gallery at City Hall, this would essentially be the first image that you see along with our main signage. Um, next, please. Oh, okay. I'll just go with the flow with whatever <laughs> image pops up. Um, just to give a little backdrop, uh, when when Pam Penniston and uh, Jeremy contacted me to join them for um, the curating of this 50 Years of Pride, um, uh, we, we sort of talked about how we wanted to go about organizing this project, um, recognizing that in the very, very early years when it was a very small event and of course, Gerard and, and Amy can get into that um, in their presentation. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of diversity at the time. And um, I think I can safely say that there weren't a lot of women involved at the time. So, so uh, that one of the challenges that Pam and I uh, faced in delving into the archives is looking for images from the early years. And even that was um, a challenge because um, it's not like today where everybody has a cell phone and, you know, and they could take not only still photos, but they can take videos. So um, we started to call through the archives of um, collections that had been donated by various people and uh, looked at a lot of uh, black and whites. And thanks to uh, uh, Gerard, uh, I was able to kind of figure out how things were organized uh, down at the Historical Society and, you know, see what they had on file. And um, Isaac down there was also very helpful in, in assisting us to locate things by subject matter, if not by particular um, uh, people that we knew were participants of those parades. Um, this one you see here is a little bit more recent. This one is um, uh, Miss Major and Alicia Garza. And this one was taken, let me look real quick, um, by Jane Cleland, who um, I discovered when I contacted her had been a, um, she had taken pictures of the parade and the events for 25 years. 
And um, one, of the, one of the challenges for her and also some of our many photographers who uh, delved into their own archives is, you know, uh, in the early years, they were taking images with film and, and then later transitioned to, to digital. But if you were asking them to look through their film archives, um, it really was a challenge to figure out, could they locate those images? You know, how well were they organized in those early years? Um, so uh, uh, the other thing is, you know, we had asked them if they could find, if they had taken pictures, could they submit 10 photos? Now for somebody like Jane, because she took thousands over the years, it was a daunting task to go in and, and figure out, oh my God, narrowing, narrowing it down to 10, you know, of whatever she thought were her strongest images that represented it, the, um, the pride and, and other festivities that happened on that weekend. Uh, but she came through with some gems. And this one is, uh, as I say, Miss Majors, who just had a, I'm not sure how long ago she had a documentary done of her, but a uh, very, very well-known activist in the transgender community. And this is Alicia Garza, who is uh, the co-founder of uh, Black Lives Matter. So they were in um, the parade. Um, next, please. Next slide, please. Okay, it looks like, uh, are we gonna be showing Kathy's? Number two. One of the things that we noticed when we are going through these images, whether they came from the archives or came through the photographers, is that, um, they tended to fall into ca categories. And although we were thinking about uh, a variety of different um, themes, like um, uh, people who were very well known in the community, or they were allies of the community of various uh, celebrities or politicians or whatever that have, um, you know, been by our side and supported many of our issues over the years. Um, okay, right now we're looking at um, an image by Kathy Cade, who um, uh, took this picture of a, a called Transgender Family in 1994. And um, one of the things that we discovered when we were trying to locate certain photographers and, you know, um, and along certain themes and whatnot. I discovered when I contacted her that she had sent her uh, photographic collection to the Bancroft Library. And um, before I went over to Berkeley, I decided to you know, see if possibly there might be something in the uh, Historical Society, but there wasn't anything relating to the particular issues that we were looking for. So, um, then I contacted our main library in San Francisco and discovered that she had donated a box of um, mounted black and white images and three of them uh, were within our themes. So uh, this was one of them. And I was happy that I was able to work with the Bancroft because they actually hold the, um, the rights to her collection. Yeah, and they're the, you know, they're the repository of her archive. So we were able to work together and uh, I was able to get high res images scanned uh, from the main library for this show. Next slide, please. Okay, this was a picture, it's actually a poster, a frame poster and the image was taken by Chloe Atkins um, in 1993, and it is uh, advertising or announcing the uh, 
after parade dance party at the sound factory down uh, south of market on Harrison. And um, I think it, it really nicely shows the uh, women's participation uh, a little bit later on. And uh, we were happy that she was able to provide that along with some other gems, which um, if you go online to the uh, website for 50 Years of Pride that Nalini uh, nicely put together, uh, you can see other samples of her work. Um, I think a lot of people who were used to coming to the parade over the years, as it expanded, there were more and more events surrounding the parade, like you know the, the, the Dyke March, and then before that, the Trans March, and all of these other e events, and then Pink Saturday. So one of the things that Pam and I uh, decided was, rather than focus simply on the parade, uh, we wanted to kind of give a feel for what that entire weekend uh, was like and experienced, um, where even though these various events, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday were organized by a variety of different unrelated organizations, uh, for many of us, it's become sort of the um, culmination of Pride Month. So um, this dance party was, you know, part of that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, here's a timely photo. This was taken in 2012 by uh, Danny Nicoletta, um, who, by the way, if you haven't seen his wonderful book uh, uh, documenting the queer community, it's it'd be really beautiful. Um, and he took this one of John Lewis and Stuart um, Gaffney, uh, who were married in 2008 before marriage equality became a reality. Uh, and as we all know, you know, there were a lot of starts and stops to this um, uh, actually becoming the law of the land, but uh, Danny captured this beautiful portrait of John and, um, and Stuart, um, who, you know, they, they were one of, they're two of the primary people that became the face of marriage equality in their fight to, you know, make it uh, happen. And thankfully, they did it then because uh, today I think it would be extremely difficult given our current Supreme Court makeup. Next, please. Okay, this one was also taken by uh, Danny, and it is a picture of Randy P. Burns and Bambi Raven Littlefeather. Uh, and this was done in the year 2000. Bam. Um, Randy, who, uh, who uh, you may recognize, he is the co-founder along with Barbara Cameron, who's uh, no longer around, um, of the Gay American Indians. And I thought this was a beautiful image capture. Um, I think it was actually cropped in from a larger image, but uh, I thought that was a really nice representation of the two of them. Um, in the uh, website that we have, uh, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I'm, it might have been Greg Day or somebody else who shot Randy and um, a whole Gay American Indians uh, contingent a little later because that one's in color. Um, but anyway, uh, I was happy to come across this one. And this one is also in uh, Danny's book. Next, please. Okay, this one is the Blazing Redheads taken by uh, L.A. Hyder, otherwise, otherwise known to us as Happy Hyder. And this was done in 1987, and I believe it was in the Civic Center area after the main parade where people come in and party. Um, nice black and white. Uh, I'm glad that she was able to pull some of these older images out. And you'll see other samples of her work online as well. Um, let's see. Okay, let's go to the next image. Okay, here's an old one by, um, this one is of Gabrielle Daniels and Merle Wu, who is a well-known um, activist. And um, she's a writer and poet, and if you uh, look at her bio, 
one of the uh, things that she was well known for is fighting the UC system who uh, tried to fire her or let her go uh, because of her views and because she was a lesbian. Um, and I believe she won that fight. Uh, let me see here. This was taken, hold on. Wait a minute, where did it go? Oh, this was taken by uh, Joan E. Byron, otherwise known as Jeb, in 1980. And uh, Merle is still around, giving the good fight. Next, please. Okay, this one is called Royalty, and this was done in 2011 by Adam Chin. Um, we weren't sure whether these were spectators or people actually participating in the parade, but I thought it was a beautiful image capture down on Market Street, or possibly just off to the side there. Next, please. Okay, in going through the archives, um, what we were looking for were a variety of different pieces of ephemera that kind of give an idea of um, what was going on. And, and one of the, our little favorites here was the cover of a Pride program from 1982. And uh, on the, on, on the uh, website that we have, we've also selected some other images where you see the, um, the parade route and, and other things that documented the parade over the years. Some by, you know, uh, photographers that we knew, uh, know, like Rink, uh, who's also in the show. Uh, and what, what we were planning to do in the um, designing, in our designing of the City Hall exhibit, which was a logistical challenge because if you, if the viewers have not been down in that space, uh, it's challenging for a number of reasons that the halls are extremely narrow and there's a lot of um, breaks in those walls as well as a large uh, strip of marble that's about a little over four feet high that runs along the entire bottom. So it kind of uh, created uh, challenges in terms of how we space these images, how they would flow, we had to be aware of um, things like the fire alarm, um, ventilating systems and doors and things like that. So what we had uh, decided to do, uh, which unfortunately we can't see, is um, to intersperse things like, like this from the archives with images that were submitted by the uh, photographers. And another challenge is that um, the Arts Commission uh, was very generous in uh, um, making available their frames, which were in a variety of different sizes. And so what we had to do was try to, you know, figure out uh, the proportions of these various images because they were not uniform given that, you know, even one photographer might not have uniform dimensions for their shots um between film and digital and then the variety of photographers that we had um and then the variety of ephemera that we had that we were going to blow up um so uh one of the things that i did was uh reached out to roger erickson who had had a show in that space and he was very generous in providing a pdf file of all the images he, that he had which included all the measurements to his images. Now his were a little bit more uniform, but that gave me a starting point from which to decide, you know, okay, we've got X number of frames of a given size, what images of ours will fit in those? And so we were, I mean, the plan was to have 100 images, approximately 100 images of uh, ephemera and, and photos uh, from the photographers to amplify the history that was provided by the historical society. So Pam and I were mapping everything out. We had little digital uh, images of each photo, each piece of ephemera, all laid out and uh, digitally put together. So and following the map that the Arts Commission had, so that we knew where each 
image was going to go uh, with perhaps um, participants from the festival or for the parade on one side of the wall and then um, spectators on the other. So there would be a natural flow and it was our uh, hope that as people descended those stairs and went in one direction or in the other down those halls, they would get a sense of how people would experience those parades over the years. The other thing that we decided to do is rather than creating a timeline, uh, we just wanted to have something that gave an idea of um, the celebratory nature, uh, the political people that were involved, and you know, so, so it kind of gave a balance to how it looked and felt. Next slide, please. Okay, this one was taken by Mason Smith. Um, it's uh, called Simone and Zoe at Pink Saturday in 2009 in front of the Twin Peaks uh, bar on the corner of Market and Cashel. And we really, really like this, both for uh, aesthetically and the color saturation. It, it had a sort of cinematography uh, feel to it. Uh, and he has several images in the show. A lot of his um, images are fo focused on the uh, transgender community. Uh, he is um, uh, considers himself they, uh, two-spirit, and multiple ethnicities, uh, Black, Jewish, I believe, if I'm not forgetting. Um, and so he brings his variety of different um, identities and cultural experiences to the images that he captured. And if you go online, you'll see others from uh, <coughs> from the trans from the trans march that usually happens on Friday. <coughs> Next, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, this is the one that um, Jeremy was referring to that was taken by me in 2017. Um, that year, I was looking for a number of different contingents and personalities that I knew were going to be in it. <clears throat> and Alex Ewan is uh, a drag king, as we all know, or as many of us know. Uh, and she was a community grand marshal that year. So she was there with a uh, huge, her huge banner with um, a uh, large contingent that was at the, I think it was pretty near the front, of, near the front of the parade after the Dykes on Bikes. Um, and so for that one, um, usually what I do when I, when I take these parade pictures, I try to get down to 8th and Market early in the morning so I can scope out a good spot and be able to either um, zoom in or be very near them as they approach. And as I saw the banner coming up Market Street, I just sort of readied myself for this image and I just kept firing away. And this was my favorite. I think it turned out really nicely because it shows a, a variety of different um, uh, women involved and di uh, different color spectrum and, uh, and the size. I thought it just really popped. Next, please. Okay, this one was taken uh, from uh, the archives and it was done by uh, Marie Ueda. I, th I wasn't able to get back in and actually look at the, um, the, the back and, and see if there was more information, but from the folder that I pulled it out of, uh, it was, uh, pro it was cons it called the early gay movement, which a lot of her stuff when she was here in the, in the city over a period of years, we're taking in the uh, late 70s to early 80s, and maybe Gerard can pipe, pipe in later uh, if he knows. But it was really actually kind of um, interesting because she is a uh, Japanese-born journalist who happened to be in the city, and she would periodically come in. She did a lot of global traveling. I think she's still around. Uh, but this was one of her image captures. And what Pam and I found kind of uh, interesting is that there's another picture um, that we selected, and I think it's on our website, taken by Kathy Cade. And it looks like they must have been standing on maybe opposite sides of the street around the same time, because we see a very similar um, image with these same signs, a few different people on the, the sides of the frame. Um, in the same location. And we found that true of some of the other images that we came across. 
that a number of photographers were down in the same general area and taking pictures of different people, but from different angles. We also found uh, pictures taken of uh, the same people in the parade over a period of years, and uh, which was kind of amusing. And we had hoped to be able to show some of those together as well to, sh to compare. Anyway, this, this really highlights um, the years that uh, uh, the community was fighting Anita Bryan and, and all of the homophobes. And, and I think it was just a powerful, powerful image. So uh, we, we really uh, loved coming across that one. And that one's from the uh, GLBT Historical Society archives. Next, please. Okay, this is an image by, um, of Sunny Wolf, uh, considered the founding mother of Dykes on Bikes. Um, and this one was taken by Jane Cleland in 2014. And I, I love it because it's just so powerful. It's right close up. And I really think it speaks volumes. Next, please. Okay, this one we, we found I, I, on one of my trips to the archives and I was chatting with, um, I can't remember if Gerard was there, but Isaac was down there. And I think Ramon Silvestri was down there. And uh, somebody pulled out this uh, photo on canvas. And initially when I saw it, I thought it was a painting. You know, um, there was just something wonderful about it. And um, it, it's kind of large. I can't remember the dimensions offhand, but it's a, it's a nice sizable image. And um, as I looked at it, I said, hmm, you know, because it was on canvas and I thought, uh, can we include this in the show? Because, you know, uh, I wasn't sure how far we were going to go with the idea of photos. And then they all piped up, of course, it's a photo on a canvas. You know, we're going to have digital, we're going to have all these other things. So we decided, okay, we're going to go with it. And um, that one was going to be, I believe, at one end of City Hall, uh, opposite a different image of uh, the people on stage uh, in Civic Center. So it, it's really too bad that we weren't able to uh, show this because it was gonna be one of our main anchor pieces to draw viewers to go down the hall and wander around and take a look at the rest of the exhibit. This one was by James McNamara uh, in 1978. And I'm not sure, but um, he's passed on, but I can't re recall how long ago, but I thought it was a, we thought it was a wonderful image. Next, please. Okay, this one is called, hold on, uh, Women on the Verge by Saul Bromberger and Sandra Hoover. And this was taken in 1990. If you look at the uh, website at your leisure, you'll find a number of images taken of dykes on bikes over the years, some where you see them lining up and getting ready to start at the ferry building, others as they're zooming along. Uh, and, and this others like this, uh, where they're close ups and show, you know, a little bit more of their personalities. Um, look, looks like they're getting ready to, to start up here. Uh, but there's also other images by uh, the same pair that really document um, what was going on down on Market Street. Next, please. Is that it? That's the end, yep. Okay, great. Lenora, thank you so much for all that detail. It's really uh, interesting to hear uh, your uh, process, a little bit about your process in uh, finding and discovering and selecting these images. And indeed, it is a shame that the exhibition is not, uh, we had hoped that it would be a delayed opening at City Hall and that we would be able to have the exhibit uh, and it was to be in the basement, a hundred different images in the basement of right. City Hall. Um, and, uh, and I was particularly excited because it was going to be a whole year, not only the 50th anniversary of Pride in San Francisco, where there was going to be a big party as there is every year in City Hall um, and uh, various other events, but also, of course, the election year when a lot of, a lot of people in San Francisco to, go to vote 
um, in the basement of City Hall and would have been exposed to these images. And so, um, and I just also want to note that um, I think the online exhibition that we have right now, 50 Years of Pride, um, still doesn't include the full 100 images that, that were to be on exhibit at City Hall because uh, when shut, the shutdown went into effect, we hadn't finished uh, scanning all, all of the images uh, that were to be included. And so uh, we're going to be adding those as, we, as we're able to get back into the offices uh, to do that work. So again, we're going to come back to you, Lenora, and uh, include you in the uh, discussion with the others. Um, and I'm, I'm also grateful to see a lively chat happening. Um, uh, some interesting comments from uh, former board member Mark Stein, or uh, somebody quoting Mark, um, actually, Don, I guess, is quoting Mark. Um, and others uh, commenting on your uh, your commentary, Lenore, as we go along. So you might want to take a look at that. Um, and uh, so with that, we're going to turn to, turn to our third um, exhibition, uh, Labor of Love, which, as I said, just went up uh, last week. Uh, Labor of Love, the Birth of San Francisco Pride, 1970 to 1980, is curated by... Uh, we have all three curators here with us today, Gerard Koskovich, Don Romsberg, and Amy Siyoshi. Uh, the exhibition, uh, looking closely at the first decade of Pride in San Francisco, shows us how San Francisco forged the internationally renowned annual celebration that would come to be known as Pride. Um, so I'm going to uh, introduce each of the panelists and then turn it over to them to uh, uh, walk us through the exhibition and their process. Uh, first, uh, Gerard Koskovich is a San Francisco historian and rare book dealer, a founding member of the GLBT Historical Society, and I think like the other two curators, also a former board member of the Historical Society. I think everybody on, on this has probably been on the board or staff um, at some point. Uh, and Gerard has been active in the movement to create LGBTQ archives and museums for nearly four decades and has curated num numerous exhibitions. Koskovic has uh, presented widely, including talks at, oh my goodness, I should have read this in advance, the Ecole de Louvre, <laughs> I'm going to try that, Kyoto University and Oxford University, and has published extensively in English and French. Most recently, he has focused on the work of Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld, 1968 to 1935, the history of queer history, in, uh, excuse me, the history of queer history in the United States, and the LGBTQ placed history. Uh, we also have Don Romsberg, a professor of women's and gender studies at Sonoma State University and a co-founder of the GLBT Historical Society Museum. He is editor of the Rutledge History of Queer America in 2018 and has published queer takes on public history, histories of adolescence, sex works, transactional ad adoption, and queer trans performers. He was the lead scholar working to bring LGBTQ content into California's K-12 history social science framework and textbooks and now trains educators on implementation. For these efforts, he is the namesake of the Committee on LGBT History's Don Romsberg Prize for K-12 curriculum. <laughs> that was a mouthful. Amy Siyoshi is Dean of the College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco State University. A historian by training, her research lies at the intersection of Asian American studies and sexuality studies. She has authored two books, Queer Compulsions, Race, Nation, and Sexuality in the Affairs of Yona Noguchi, 2012, and Discriminating Sex, White Leisure, and the Making of the American Oriental, 2018. Siyoshi is a founding co-curator of the GLBT Historical Society Museum and served as co-chair of the inaugural Queer History Conference 2019, hosted by the Committee on LGBTQ, uh, excuse me, LGBT History. Um, so with that, uh, which one of you wants to take, uh, take the lead on, uh, or all three of you, please unmute, and one of you can take the lead on uh, screen sharing. Thank you very much. I'll be jumping in first to do a little introduction and then passing along to uh, Don and to Amy. So let's see if I can get my screen share going here. Uh, hmm. uh, uh, uh. Not finding what I want. Okay, screen share difficulties. 
One more try. Hmm. Hmm. Lee, do you have any advice for me here? Um, what error are you getting? Do you want to just check? I'm simply me? seeing a Dropbox and Google Drive and whatnot rather than my desktop. Uh, go to basic. I think that you are on fire. Got it. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. That's what I did. And now let's just go like this and go view slideshow. Okay. That's what we want to see. Thank you very much. So just to kick off, let me make a couple of sort of framing remarks. One is that of as folks probably know, San Francisco Pride marks its 50th anniversary this year. San Francisco is one of the four cities to have a march that first year in 1970. Ours was quite small. Uh, it's also an exceptional year because, of course, the Pride celebration canceled for the first time in their history uh, and due to the coronavirus pandemic. Ordinarily, we would have expected Pride this year to attract something in the range of two million participants to San Francisco. Uh, and instead, we have all been looking for creative ways to honor this history and to continue building solidarity. Now, given Pride's half century of existence and its status as one of the world's largest and most visible annual gatherings of LGBTQ people and our allies, uh, the aid and celebration have come to feel for many of us like a kind of inevitable part of San Francisco's political, economic, and cultural landscape. An annual event that brings two million people to the city uh, does not seem like a scrappy ragtag uh, activist effort. Uh, and I think that uh, when Amy and Don and I began working on the show a year and a half ago now, our first question was to try to stand away from how big and massive and inevitable pride seems and to go back to the beginning and try to ask for ourselves, where did this come from? Uh, we also thought of some of the themes and conflicts and discussions and interactions that we've seen in our experiences of pride. I first went to pride in 1979 in San Francisco and asked ourselves, where did those come from? And began looking back. Uh, at its core, the exhibition uh, reminds us that pride isn't a given, that it isn't an inevitable institution, that it emerged from a constantly shifting mix of desire and hope, of struggle and celebration, and that those are forces that remain central to the parade today. Uh, and in Labor of Love, we also hear some echoes uh, of history in the debates about pride that will be familiar to anybody who has taken part in the event or followed the news about it in the last five years or 10 years or 20 years, 30 years, uh, that, um, that uh, these forces that we traced all the way back to the beginning of the parade uh, continue to shape the events in many ways today. Uh, so uh, let me show just a couple of quick pictures that I'd like to take a look at. Uh, and let me suggest again that one of the really interesting things about the process, it's been a real pleasure working with Don and Amy. We've had the, the experience of working on a number of shows together for the Historical Society previously, so we're old hands at collaborating. And our process really took us to, let's go and look at everything that we have in the archives first and see what questions those materials prompt for us, rather than coming with a real preconceived uh, framework of how we were going to think about pride. And I think the other thing that we could probably say is that the ones we do look at in the exhibition are a small handful of the themes that we would have loved to explore if we had a much larger show. Uh, and so, for example, we don't really look at the growth of the parade in terms of numbers and what factors and forces led to that growth. We simply notice that it's happening, but we don't explore it particularly. Similarly, we don't explore terribly much how media representations, both in the LGBTQ media and the general distribution media, have evolved over time with regard to the parade. Uh, it was frustrating not to have a Smithsonian Museum sized space in five years to work on this show. Uh, there's a great book about the history of pride to be done is one of the things we've noticed. So let's just take a little look here. 
we cut the show up into five sections and each of us acted as a kind of lead curator on various sections uh, and then had tremendous collaboration involvement and creative reworking from the other curators. That's one of our standard working methods so that everybody isn't trying to be in charge of everything at once. Uh, and uh, this, uh, one of the sections that I worked on was the opening section, which is called Why Pride? One of the first questions that really came to us was to start noticing why did people do this in the first place and why do they keep doing it all these years later after 50 years, particularly given the amount of work involved, the amount of strife, conflict, trauma, uh, negotiating, uh, efforts to decide who belongs and who doesn't trying to bring this thing together. Uh, anyone who's on the Pride board, Amy is one of them, or otherwise involved in Pride knows that it's a tremendous amount of work and you don't necessarily get an awful lot of thanks. Why did people keep doing it for 50 years and continue doing it? Uh, and why did they think it mattered? So here we see just one of the statements from the parade committee uh, that I think help us understand this. Within the first three years, there was no parade in 1971. There was one in 1972. Already by 72, 73, a kind of basic point of the parade had emerged, a sort of consensus and it remains active to this day that bringing together LGBTQ people in all our diversity and in vast numbers and being highly visible at least one day out of the year is a way to empower ourselves and each other, a way to change society's images and ideas about us, and a way to declare to the political structure that there are an awful lot of us and you'd better listen to us and start changing how things are done in this country, that that quickly became the basic purpose of the parade with the added purpose there from day one. And we want to have a good time while doing it. Uh, we're a bunch of queers and we want to have a party at the same time that we're making political demands and that those two things go together in some ways. Uh, so here's from the 1975 uh, Gay Freedom Day Parade program, the statement from the committee that helps us get a sense of, uh, of this. And it also brings to our awareness how early people organizing the prayer, the intersectionality of LGBTQ experience, a word that didn't exist yet at the time, but an experience that did, the importance of honoring all the different constituents of the LGBT community and the possibility of moving uh, our movement forward through coalition politics treating those points of intersectionality as points of entry into finding uh, supporters and coalitions in other communities, even on LGBTQ people. And we see here in this statement, the basic, the more visible we are, the stronger we become. But also that the parade is about, and I'm quoting, to help, about help us secure the creation of a just, free, and loving society by eliminating sexism, ageism, racism, and elitism. Elitism being a word that was used then to really kind of signal social class and cultural capital. Uh, this also reminds us that not only was that commitment there from the beginning, but as with all such commitments, putting it into action has been a tremendous challenge. And there's often been more good sentiments than real execution. Uh, and that remains a struggle to this day. Uh, that's what I'm going to say about one little piece that I took a look at. Let's skip along and hand off to Don now to talk a bit about a couple of images from a section that he curated. Uh, thanks, Gerard. Um, you did a really good job introing our, our show. Thank you so much. You always make us sound so smart. Um, yeah, so I was uh, uh, tasked with uh, focusing on the uh, big gay family, we decided to call it part of the exhibit, which uh, was a part of the exhibit that we, we intentionally, we originally called it big queer family. And we changed it to big gay family because uh, in the 1970s, um, gay very much was, uh, it served the same umbrella function that queer has served since the 1990s. Not necessarily as much of the sort of oppositional to normativity, although it was liberationist, right, in its, in its uh, nomenclature, but, um, but definitely um, it was intended to cover a lot, right? And um, uh, lesbian feminism certainly pushed hard against that, and that's why we see uh, the actual explicit naming of lesbian and then later in the 90s bisexual and transgender for the for the parade. Um, 
But what I wanted to show was that I was, I was really struck by the sheer diversity of folks who vied for visibility within the collective that was the parade, right? Um, and that one of the things that was really striking about coming together as this big gay dysfunctional family was that we didn't come together um, in a sense of unity that meant that we were supposed to conform to a kind of sameness, but that we were this co collectivity that was a, uh, an expression of solidarity, uh, but also a definition of um, our difference from one another. And so these are just two of the, um, the images that really struck me here. Uh, the first one, we really by Crawford Bar Barton, we were really struck. This is on a small slide in the archive and we sort of had to go down and look and see it and pull it up from here, um, which is why it has that red X on the top. Um, um, but uh, it shows um, that very, very early on, 1973, um, there were people in the community who were naming bisexuality and asexuality as part of what makes up the gay community, right? The queer community. Um, and I also like how it invokes God. Um, we noticed, and we, we highlight this in the Big Gay Family section, the way in which faith was used both, of course, as a cudgel of homophobia, right, to strike against us. And I think any of us who go to any pride parade anywhere are quite familiar with the homophobes over on the corner screaming at us, right, that that's like um, part of it and screaming back at them is part of the joy of being queer, right? Um, but that there were also a lot of communities of faith um, that were queer, that were LGBTQIA, right, uh, plus, and that here we see two people who are um, uh, speaking out in 1973 about how they belong in the parade and in the community. Uh, and then the second one, uh, another one that comes from uh, uh, Marie uh, Ueda um, from the Historical Society's collection, um, this is a fairly widely circulated image, um, the Third World Gay Caucus. And I love this, of course, because it asserts a kind of um, collectivity around communities of color, that it's not just about um, Black or Asian American or Latinx or Native American, right? That what's really happening here is the early um, uh, understanding of how communities of color because of settler colonialism, because of um, uh, um, imperialism, uh, because of white supremacy, right? Need to come together and speak uh, both to our community and beyond our community as a collective uh, um, group about their vitality and um, their political sort of impulse to show up in terms of visibility, right? So I, I love this image for that reason. Um, I also love this image because even as it's doing this kind of um, solidarity of collectivity and difference, right? Uh, you also have that sign in the back that says gay rights or human rights. And so I, I love how it, it also sort of pushes for this kind of universal value of our rights, of our belonging to a larger world of humans um, that we should be represented uh, as part of what makes up the fullness of humanity. Uh, and so I love these two images, right? Because they, they both um, speak to this kind of, we're all here together, uh, but uh, we're all here together standing in coalition in solidarity in difference with one another. Um, so I think I will hand it over to Amy, except I do want to say that um, th this is maybe obvious to a lot of people, but it wasn't to me. I didn't feel it deeply until I did this section um, that one of the most important things that the uh, Pride Parade does is there's nothing that necessarily ties lesbians and uh, gay men and communities of color who, have, who are queer and trans people and bi people and asexual people together. Uh, we had our own bars, we had our own, um, you know, bathhouses and sports clubs and things in the 1970s. And so this was the one space in the entire year where we all came together and um, in doing so, 
we began to, I think, imagine ourselves as what we now think of as the LGBTQ plus community, right? So it's because of this annual space that we could gather in, that we could continually reaffirm that we all collectively belong to one another. And I was so moved to participate in the recent march um, from the federal courthouse down to Compton's at Turk and Taylor um, that was centered around the lives of black trans people, but um, black and indigenous trans people, I should say, um, but that so many people came together to be a part of that march that was part of this Black Lives Matter defund the police moment, right? Um, and I think that there's a way in which we can, we can trace a thread of that impulse back to these early pride parades. Thank you very much, John. We're gonna hand off to Amy now. I'll have to skip a couple of slides I have here, but we'll go find her slides. So give me a moment. Let's just see here. Uh, okay, here's one of Amy's slides and I'll hand off to Amy. Whoops, there we are. Great, thank you. Thank you, Gerard. Keeps moving, I'm not sure. It's okay, we can just keep it as is. Gerard? Yes. Okay, great, okay, great, thanks. All right, so, um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about, um, you know, I think my own process, right? Working both with uh, Don and Gerard, obviously, but um, I, I think for me, um, pride was really important when I was just came coming out. And then um, after I was no longer a baby dyke and more like a middle-aged queer, uh, pride itself became less important. I was still heavily invested in things like dyke mark and dyke march and trans march. Um, as well as the various potlucks and picnics and community events that were happening um, by um, more grassroots orgs. But Pride, the sort of larger Pride parade and festival was not as crucial for my, um, you know, being queer later in life as it was at the, at the very beginning. And so when I, when I went into, and I am on the Pride board, yes, that's correct. But when I went into doing this exhibit, I think I really wanted to, to figure out, you know, what, what, what is the real importance of pride, even as today pride faces much criticism for uh, being too corporate, uh, being too capitalist, in, including the police, right? There's a whole host of um, issues that pride faces today. And what, what I found was I read this book by uh, Kath, Catherine Bruce uh, called Pride Parades, How a Parade Changed the World. And Bruce basically argues that pride was able to change the, the cultural, cultural views around um, queers. So I may not necessarily be doing the activist, the traditional activist work, such as legislative work, or doing things like anti-poverty work or homelessness, right? But across the years, it's actually made queers more acceptable to the mainstream. Um, and Bruce argues that that's an incredible thing that Pride has done. And you can see it sort of in the ways in which uh, folks have participated in Pride and how Pride has grown, how much mainstream acceptance uh, Pride uh, has sort of uh, manifested in terms of how um, a lot of straight folks are now participating in, in Pride as well, and as well as supporting, supporting Pride. And so that was um, both uh, I, I don't want to, it was both an, an eye-opening and also a, a way for me to rethink Pride. Uh, Pride also did a survey a couple years ago um, with all the folks who were, as many folks as they could coming into the festival, and they found that the vast majority of the participants were in fact, uh, it was their first time in Pride, which again, we probably already know this, at least uh, subconsciously, if not explicitly, but that Pride, the festival itself, does tremendous work in terms of people who are first coming out. Um, and through my involvement, obviously, on the Pride Board, I've seen how uh, at, at the global international level, um, Pride plays a tremendous role. I think there's a way in which we all, um, you know, folks who are sort of more middle-aged to older and a little more grumpy, we all kind of lament that, uh, uh, that Pride has, has lost its radical edge, right? And I wanted to, when I saw this um, program from 1972, Christopher Street West, this is the slide that's up now. Uh, this was the logo for that year. Uh, I was moved both by the fist, which is the center of the butterfly, um, 
which is a hearkening of black power, right? But it's gay power, in, in, immersed in sort of these butterfly wings, which to me signals mariposa consciousness. It may not have been those words back in the day, uh, but definitely I feel like um, a call to both uh, queer nationalism or being proud of being sort of a butterfly or a unicorn in today's, um, today's language, but also solidarity with things like uh, Black Power and other cultural nationalist movements that were going on at the time. Next slide. Uh, so this one, uh, this one to me was very powerful uh, because I think there's a way in which, especially being on the Pride Board now, that um, I sometimes wondered if, if all of the problems that we faced um, were new, and clearly they weren't, right? And this became explicitly queer uh, doing, doing the exhibits. Um, I was charged with a section on Pride fights, uh, and it was so, so enlightening, as well as heartening to know that um, original organizers str struggled around how to put together a Gay Freedom Day parade. In fact, in, in the earliest years, um, it's not this flyer, but there's another flyer that you'll see on the online exhibit. Um, it, it, wasn't, it, it was a contestation over which Gay Freedom Day event you were gonna go to, or who was gonna throw the real Gay Freedom Day event. And that was, that was really cool to me, to think that we could have a choice about which Gay Freedom Day event we could go to. Um, uh, and, and also notable that folks were uh, sort of wrangling to, to, get, to get control of pride. Um, and um, this one again is, you know, points to how uh, third world gays or queers of color, as we would know, know think, think of them today, um, wanted to be included and, and heard as well uh, in the celebration and in the planning. Um, and we see this also, there's a number of flyers that also point to women also at demanding inclusion uh, in the Pride Parade. If you look at this flyer here, you'll notice too that it says, stop the Gay Freedom Day corporate board from eliminating general membership and community involvement, right? So um, this is 1980, right? They're already worried about a corporate board. Um, in this scenario, the corporate board does not mean large corporations like Google, it's pre-Google. Um, and so the, it's actually just, they're, they're even opposed to businesses participating in Gay Freedom Day, which I found fascinating. Um, and there's, there's a number of other items that's not showing here, but if you go to the online exhibit, they actually also protest what we know today of as the Imperial Court as being elitist, right? I mean, this is kind of fascinating to me because I see the Imperial Court as being so central to, to gay life. Um, and, but that was also in contestation whether they should participate in the parade as well. Um, so with that said, I, I think I'd like to pass on to whomever is next. If I can jump back just for a little closing minute on our exhibition and then probably hand off to, to Terry for a Q&A. This is the end of the Labor of Love exhibition. We were quite thrilled to find this flyer from 1980, from October, so after the parade that year. And it very much centers what Amy was just talking about, that there was a constant struggle over who would shape the parade and how, what it should be for. And uh, the parade committee in 1980 held an open meeting in October saying, what do you want the parade to be? That same year, one of the people who organized one of the earliest parades, Reverend Robert Humphreys, who organized the parade, co-organized the parade in 1972, uh, in 1973, said uh, in a letter to the editor of the Bay Area Reporter, the parade belongs to the people who march in it, not to the board of directors of the parade or the committee that directs it, uh, that they are stewards of the community and that each and every person in the parade are the people who have the power. Uh, that's been a constant and interesting struggle uh, throughout the history of the parade. And here in 1980, we have the parade committee saying, come tell us, uh, it's up to you. And we also wanted to end the exhibition with this, with this um, question. Don or Amy, do you want to sort of give a sense of what we're doing with this question at the end of the exhibition? Okay, 
One of you can. I'm always going to wait for you to speak first, Amy, if you want to. Okay, all right, fine. I don't really like speaking, but I'll do it. Um, <laughs> so, so we do have um, on the online exhibit. Maybe Don, you can help uh, help you know end it after I say this little thing. Uh, on the online exhibit, we do have a little uh, thing like a form that you can fill out. Um, we wanted the exhibit to be uh, you know provocative of thought, right? Not just an educational thing, but also like to, we didn't want it to just convey information. We wanted it to be a place where people will be provoked into thinking and having a discussion. And so we do have a, a little thing that you fill out to tell us what you see as the future of, of Pride. Don? Yeah, no, I think that's great. And, um, and really this commitment, as Gerard says, to this idea that Pride belongs to all of us. And um, uh, I think that one of the reasons that there's been this push uh, internationally, but certainly in, across parts of North America for getting cops out of pride and getting corporations out of pride is about a reassertion that um, uh, maybe the, 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 um, the tip, the, the powers of, of, of sort of whose pride it feels like now uh, have tipped a little bit too far, right? Um, and that it doesn't feel necessarily like the people's pride for a lot of people uh, anymore. Um, but it's up to all of us, right? To be a part of this messy, fabulous, contested story of what it's going to be in the future. And I love that Amy is on the actual SF Pride board because um, boy, uh, hats off to you and anyone who, who's been on it from the beginning. Fantastic, thank you, Don and Amy. And uh, Terry, we'll hand back to you now for Q&A and open discussion. Yeah, thank you. Gerard and Amy and John for that. It was uh, really wonderful to get a little insider behind the curtain view on uh, this exciting new exhibit. And so um, there's a lot we can talk about here. We have like uh, 28 minutes left um, before we go into some questions and I'm gonna be looking in the Q&A chat box to see if any come up. We have a lot of interesting comments again in the, in the chat uh, function, but before we do that, I just wanna Speaking of corporate uh, influences, I want to thank our sponsors. So <laughs> if you'll excuse me for a moment. <laughs> so our Pride page and the included exhibitions are made possible with support from our members and donors, as well as San Francisco Pride, Wells Fargo, Nike, First Republic Bank, Grants for the Arts, the Gilbert Baker Foundation, Google, the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development, the San Francisco Arts Commission, and the San Francisco Arts Commission and Galleries. And again, members like you. So uh, <laughs> with that, um, you know, I thought, you know, we'd try to like um, uh, broach a couple of broad topics. First, I, I just wanted to talk about uh, representation and diversity within uh, the three exhibits. Um, if any of you want to uh, comment on the uh, curatorial process around that. And then second, I want to uh, hopefully get into, uh, I think, a recurring theme, uh, which is uh, uh, beyond just the question of, you know, what is the purpose of pride? But uh, really structurally, you know, what are the influences that make pride what it is today? And, you know, and, and what is the future hold perhaps for uh, the role of pride going forward? And in particular with regard to uh, corporate influence, political influences, and uh, the police. Um, so, you know, so, you know, my first, first question that I'm still formulating in my mind, honestly, is, is just around the curatorial process, because, you know, I think starting with the Gilbert Baker exhibit, uh, certainly um, the, uh, from the eight flat, eight stripe version that uh, was uh, uh, revealed at Pride in 1978, to uh, the, the nine stripe version that he, he created uh, within his last uh, year, I think. Um, the effort was to try to represent the full diversity of the LGBTQ community and, and, and to give a, a, a flag that um, uh, everyone could rally behind uh, uh, that really represented everyone. Of course, the flag has changed quite a bit, and there's a lot of different permutations and uh, representations that people are advocating for and flying around the country. But then, um, for whether it's Gilbert's exhibit or the other two Pride-related exhibits, it's you know Pride is so much. I mean, it's grown it, just in San Francisco. It's grown to over a million people, I think, descend on San Francisco plus locals. 
Um, there's hundreds of contingents representing uh, everyone from the Historical Society Museum, <laughs> as, uh, as Amy's banner in her background is, is showing there, um, uh, to, you know, Dykes and Bikes, you know, um, which is still my favorite contingent at, at, the, uh, at the parade. Um, and the, but it's in an effort to represent the entire LGBTQ plus uh, spectrum in terms of gender and sexuality, and then the intersections of race, uh, class, uh, nationality, um, ethnicity, er, you know, everything else uh, in all those different combinations. And so uh, certainly in a physical exhibit, you've got between 15, maybe 20 and 100 different images that you've got to pick to represent all of that. So what were the challenges around that, around that for each of you specifically? Does anyone want to address that question? I can start. So for me, the the challenge really was around diversity in representation. Um, a lot of what Gilbert Baker was doing with his art, it seemed that he wanted to kind of be uh, the person behind this scene. So, you know, in his memoir and in the exhibit, when we are talking about the mile long flag, Gilbert frames it as, you know, he's just the seamstress that's doing the work that, you know, he had to kind of, uh, what's the phrase, be in bed with the devil, that there was a corporate uh, organization, I forget the name of it, that did um, AIDS work that they wanted to get the money from. And so in order to get a project like that off the ground, you know, Cleve Jones was the one that was dealing with the corporation. And, you know, it was, it was um, Gilbert's, Gilbert's um, responsibility to actually sew a whole mile long flag that would have stretched the whole length of, uh, of the street. Uh, but when it came to his activism, he seemed to always be sharing this stage with either um, Scarlet Harlot or Sadie, Sadie the Rabbi Lady. Um, he routinely has stories in his memoir about kind of speaking truth to power, whether it be uh, Mayor Feinstein or the Pope. Um, so he, he really did, you know, try in his work to do all of those, those kind of, you know, concepts of speaking truth to power uh, as best he could in his position. Thank you. Uh, and Lenore, you and Pamela, um, you, uh, you actually went beyond uh, Pride specifically and you included other marches. Yeah, it, as, we, as we started to look at, um, well, let me put it this way. First of all, when, when I got the, uh, well, we got the sort of general scope of what um, you guys wanted to have, um, in the project, um, diversity was sort of at the top of the list, of course, uh, but also, um, you know, we wanted to uh, to show that it was much more than just the parade, ultimately, you know, and and particularly as Amy had had suggested um, that historically, because uh, women were not particularly uh, involved or included or welcome in the early, early years. And it was not particularly diverse in terms of ethnicity. Um, and I mean, even today, I, I think in terms of various categories, the transgender community and, and other uh, communities, it, it's still a battle to be included and, and to have the voice heard. Um, uh, and so, um, when we were looking at various events during the what's become the last weekend in in June, um, we decided that we needed to go beyond the parade itself and beyond the the party festival that happens in Civic Center area because there's so many things going on, and and so in our call to the various artists that we sort of. Uh, zeroed in on, you know, to, to make it manageable, we decided not to do like an, a huge open call because that would have been gargantuan. I mean, it was a monster project as it was. Uh, but 
we started with uh, photographers that we either knew or were aware of, or you know, we got suggestions from the Arts Commission or, or other people. Um, and, and so we started to reach out to different people, uh, one, to see if they had taken pictures and if they had, what years were covered. And also we kind of gave them some direction in terms of you know, themes that we were looking for, like we, we uh, were looking for Miss Major, for instance. Um, there were a lot of people that had images of dykes on bikes. So in, in some instances, we just had to figure out, okay, um, how do the images flow with each other? You know, and, and uh, imagining how they would look down the hall or across the hall you know, how would they interact? How would they create visual dialogue and, and those kinds of prompts? So um, it was very complex. And so looking at the images, as I said, um, at one point, I had little stamp size images that I had, uh, I put it in my iPhoto, took screenshots, narrowed those down, printed them out. And then we would, you know, we went to the African American Art and Culture Center one day because they had a large room that we could spread things out. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then later on, you know, and we kept moving things around. And as we were moving things around, that's when, you know, it began to emerge how the images were sort of talking to each other, how they related in, you know, and, and were balanced with color and black and white and, you know, just a whole variety of different things. So um, it was sort of an intuitive process i think for us and because we're very visually oriented um that was one part of it the other thing is that we're thinking with the themes of you know participants and spectators and and subcategories of you know particular people like tom amiano or or stuart gaffney and there's actually one uh one of uh, phyllis and dell that we were able to get a hold of because um, we were thinking, okay, we need to get, and this was before Phyllis died. Uh, you know, where, where can we find, uh, you know, something of them in the parade? Well, we didn't find anything specific to that in the archives. So I started Googling around and I stumbled across one by Tom Levy, I think, or Levy, however his name is pronounced. And he had taken a photo for the Chronicle. So, um, and Rick Gerharder had one too. Uh, but this one uh, seemed to capture, you know, the lighting, something about the lighting and all of that. Um, and it was taken on the same day. Uh, and so uh, we asked Nalini to, to reach out to the Chronicle and see if we could get a hold of that image. And, uh, and you know, because they have the rights to the, mm. uh, the image. Uh, and it took a while before that came through. But uh, that one's on the website, you know. So, so there are a lot of little, little issues that we had to go through. Okay. Well, thank you for all that, uh, Amy, um, John, and Gerard. I'm now. Y'all were looking at the first decade of Pride in San Francisco, um, and you know, it, it's it's hard to even compare and contrast those parades. I think from what we were expecting to happen live next week. I think a week from today in San Francisco. Um, especially in the context of the Black Lives Matter um, uh, uprising or, or burgeoning movement uh, throughout the country. Um, and I think so Pride was going to look very different this year from what we might have expected even a month ago. Um, but uh, so looking at the first 10 years, so um, did, you have, did you have challenges around representing the full diversity of the community? from the archival materials that were available. I think you did a pretty good job, but uh, uh, what were the challenges around that specifically? And, you know, if you want to talk about how that, how that fits in with what we were, what, what the contemporary issues around pride diversity, you know, you're welcome to plunge into that as well. Well, let me jump in first and just say that um, before we talk about the diversity thing, and actually when I, when I, I spoke a lot about that in my talk, so I'd love to hear from one of the other two of you. Yeah. I want to say that um, I think something that I want to echo what Gerard said is that um, pride in San Francisco was never an argument of whether it should be protest or celebration, right? It was, an, it was um, how do we make um, a celebratory protest that does something political where we can all have a lot of fun. And like from the very first sort of ragtag hippies and hair fairies walking down 
Polk Street and then the Gay Inn in the parade or in, in Golden Gate Park, um, there was always that combination. And so, um, you know, um, uh, I think it's important for us to not think of pride as um, either this or that, but always both and. I'll just say that. I'll quickly jump in and add to that. In fact, the very first poster for the Gay Inn in 1970 says that the picnic in Golden Gate Park the day after the first march of 30 odd people on Polk Street was sponsored by the Gay Celebration Front rather than the Gay Liberation Front. So even then they were playing with that and making that joke. Yesterday it was the Gay Liberation Front. Today the picnic is the Gay Celebration Front. Uh, but I think that in terms of looking at diversity as curators, Don and Amy, I always come with a big active list of 30 or 40 categories of diversity that we're looking for. Uh, and that although cisgender white gay men took up a lot of space as they always do, they didn't take up all the space even from the very beginning. Uh, and I'm gonna hand off to Amy to talk a little bit more about how she found some of the debates about that in her in her Pride Fights section. I mean, I, I do think that there were a number of, there, there, are very, there are very vocal sort of protests from across the broader queer community around representation, uh, both in terms of gender, uh, um, race, ethnicity, as well as ability, um, which, which I thought was fantastic. I was surprised to see it so early in the 70s. But one of the debates about whether they should continue to go to Golden Gate Park was that uh, that hill to get up there was difficult for those who were in wheelchairs or other, you know, had other mobility um, difficulties. So that that was moving. I think that diversity, representing diversity is, is always a struggle um, in terms of sort of, not that the people weren't there, but um, it's more about sort of which people are recorded um, in history and which people also, decide that they're worth recording, like have a sense of value, like, oh, I need to record myself, right? Um, and so uh, whether that be sort of in a photograph or a journal or whatnot. And so I do think that there are, um, you know, sometimes it's, you gotta do a little more digging uh, to find folks that really truly represent the queer community, but I don't wanna necessarily frame it as a difficulty. I just feel like it's an obligation that we have to all commit to. Um, and, and it's something that happens sort of across time, right? Um, the, the, the really striking image for me, I think, Lenore, you were the one that showed it, with, but when you showed the juxtaposition um, from the picture of the 70s with Anita Bryant and Hitler, mm -hmm. and then you showed the Alex Ewan mm -hmm. picture, like just looking at the folks, and that was so striking. Like um, the older picture in the 70s was definitely filled with more um, what what appeared to be white white guys, right? And then um, the photo with Alex Ewan in front was definitely filled with like queers of color, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that was super um, uh, sort of notable to me uh, in terms of the ways in which the representation of pride has also shifted. Uh, there's no doubt that also um, after the 1965 Immigration Act that we've seen uh, more diversity in, in the nation as a whole Right, um, California is now, I think, largely folks of color, which was not the case in, in the 1970s. So these are obviously notable differences. Um, but I, I do think that um, if we're conscientious about creating representations of folks who are underserved in terms of representation, then we obviously all have a commitment to be thinking about including all of our um, community partners in that representation. And let me just add that one of the things that Amy ended up doing, uh, not just in this show, but also with other shows that she's curated, is by asking this question, who's there and who's not there in the archive for the purpose of exhibition, um, that means that we get to bring new collections into our archive, right? And so uh, Amy was central in getting um, a collection. I think it's, is it, is it being donated? I don't want to say, right? The, okay. It will, right. it will be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, right, these photo albums that show um, uh, API um, oh. um, community, and queer community early on, right, is now going to be more present within uh, our, our collection because we asked the question, 
uh, you know, where are the gay Asian American men? And um, when we couldn't find what we wanted, we went out in the community and, and hopefully then that ends up having a, a home, you know, in our archive. And if, yeah. if we were, sorry, Terry, just to Good. throw in one other thing. If we were actually having the exhibit uh, in the museum, then we were planning on showing the photo albums, which are absolutely beautiful of Ken Hamai and some great, great pictures of, of him and his, uh, his, his uh, group of friends uh, going to their first pride in the early 1970s. And I'll just jump in and follow up on one thing that both Amy and Don said that, that Amy mentioned that it's not so much that this is a challenge, it's a responsibility. I'd go even further and say, and it's a pleasure because it forced us to think more critically about what we were seeing, to really look very closely at who was and wasn't being represented and how, and that that produces a more creative, exciting, dynamic understanding of the past and a more interesting exhibition. It's not a problem, it's a fantastic opportunity. Uh, for historians and for, for our work as historians. Uh, and I'll add following up on what Don and Amy said about this one donation, we also found that we're missing a lot of material from the 1970s. And so I hope that people who might have photographs, film, uh, artifacts, what they wore to the parade, a sign they carried, anything from those first 10 years of pride that they uh, might consider donating to the archives, that they would please uh, get in touch with our archivist and make an offer. And we've already started to receive some really great uh, in material of that sort. I was just contacted by a man in Canada who had fantastic photos of a Canadian group carrying a faggots against fascism sign in the San Francisco parade in the early 1970s. Uh, so our history is still out there to be, to be found and we hope that people will come forward with us and make our, our exhibition for the 75th anniversary of Pride even richer and more complex. Right. Yeah, and um, and I think you know uh, this is a, a despite the fact that it is um, a, a responsibility and and a, a pleasure, as you say, Gerard, uh, for us to be as inclusive and representative of the full diversity of the LGBTQ community in all of our exhibitions and programs where where it's possible. It, it, it can be a particular challenge uh, based on what materials are available in the archives. Um, and not just our archives, but writ large archives. Um, uh, and so uh, so there is some digging that has to happen sometimes. I remember, uh, I think, uh, what, Jeremy, was it your exhibition on, on bears? That, that was a particular challenge, just yeah. uh, finding diversity, you know, just because, I mean, bears is a relatively new s subculture, if you will, of the LGBT community, but uh, that was a particular, uh, a challenge, I think. Right, um, but and yep, and curating. I mean, you can only use what you what you have, right? So yeah, and 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 also, uh, you know, some some content is specific, but uh, uh, but I, you know, I am very interested in in talking more, and I think we could do a whole forum on uh, the role of uh, pride broadly in in uh, developing a higher uh, or a deeper consciousness uh, for LGBTQ. Uh, community uh, around our full diversity and how, uh, you know, that we come in so many different uh, um, communities um, together around this particular event. But uh, maybe some of you through your research, you can talk a little bit about that. You know, I mean, people often think of Pride as being this one day or one weekend thing that happens, you know, on different days around the country, but uh, generally in June. Um, and, you know, but what is the influence around the year? You know, you know, what, what kind of cultural effect has this had over the last 50 years for us? And Gerard referred to the need to write a book. I, I don't know if this is on his list of books to write, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, can any of you uh, talk about that? I think when I was uh, referring to Catherine Bruce's book, um, she, she was arguing that basically pride has um, been able to make America like us. Um, and that, that's like the single most important contribution that pride has done. It's been a critical in a cultural shift, right? And this cultural shift has then enabled uh, legislative changes, right? Um, as well as other kind of uh, political movements that have allowed 
straight people to not be so freaked out about us, right? Uh, and that's sort of what she argues. I don't know if other folks have other ideas about this. Well, but, we're that, but we oh, are, go ahead, Vaughn. Yeah. I was gonna say that, um, uh, you know, organizing a pride con contingent, uh, if you're, you know, LGBTQ youth uh, in the late 1970s, for example, um, it means that you're starting to think about yourselves as a, or not, not necessarily starting, but you're organizing yourselves um, as a, as a political entity of some sort of uh, an entity of visibility. And so, I mean, there is organizing that's happening year round um, very early on uh, to prepare for the next year at Pride. And you see this flurry of act, you see this activity in sort of September, October, and then this flurry of activity that happens in January, February, March, where people are like, um, uh, we don't like what Pride is doing and we want this instead, or this needs, we need to make sure that this group is visible at this Pride or whatever. And so I think that those, those things suggest that um, Pride has entered our consciousness by the 1970s in a way that a lot of people use it as a tool for organizing around larger ways to take up public space or to take up political space. Right. I'll just jump in with, if I can, I'll just jump in quickly with one that since it's the 50th anniversary of Pride, something that that is particularly vivid for me is that Pride is probably the oldest continuous touchstone for LGBTQ organizing and culture that people across the United States and around the world are familiar with. And that the first time you go to Pride now, any time in the last 25 years, you weren't just entering a march, you were entering a place in history. You were claiming a place in the generational transmission of our movement and our demands, that it is now a historical institution that people are inheriting and passing along. A hundred years ago, LGBTQ people didn't have anything like that. And it's now an international historical institution. So it's a place where we own our own place in time and history once a year and share that with people around the world, a really empowering thing for us as queer people. And I think, you know, I mean, we've talked a lot, we only have a couple of minutes left, but we've talked a lot about uh, the move towards inclusiveness and, and cultural uh, diversity as part of the organizing and representation in Pride itself. And yet there were the countervailing forces, um, and I think uh, Amy in particular, you were delving into this around exclusion, you know, who who should be excluded from Pride, and we're still of course experiencing that today as, as a couple of you remarked around corporations and the police. Um, Wow, you know, we could really talk about that in particular for um, an hour and somehow the two hours has slipped by. <laughs> uh, so, um, but I, you know, if anybody like wants to like chime in and just say, you know, what 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 is the next 50 years of pride hold? Uh, does it become something else in over the next decade or 20 or 30 years? Um, does it become something, would, would it have become this year something different that's beyond LGBTQ rights specifically and more into uh, 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 broader civil rights issues? Um, so I, I think that um, actually queers have actually been involved in sort of broader civil rights issues. We, we probably all know this. Emily, uh, Emily Hobson has this great book um, about how queers were in the 1980s in particular were active in all these anti-imperial, anti-colonial movements. Um, and, and I think that that is oftentimes reflected in the parade itself, right? When people are holding high signs and things like that, but may not be reflected necessarily in the pride, the organization of the, the pride as an agency. And so I do think that sometimes there's a myth that LGBT organizing or core organizing is only about sexuality, but it's historically never only been about sexuality. It's always been a multi-issue kind of coalition political movement. Um, but I, I also think that this year in particular, uh, not just because of COVID, but in particular because of the movement for Black Lives, that there is a distinct shift um, that's happening with the agency. Um, that I, I think that um, th it's an opportunity for the agency at this point to rethink how, how we're doing Pride and how we're going to do Pride uh, next year. 
um, without revealing too much, because I really don't know that much, but I know that folks are talking about rethinking Pride. So I do think that there's a real opportunity. Um, our, our board president is actually Carol, Carolyn Wissinger, who's very active in um, the Black queer community here in the Bay, as well as in LA. And so there's been a lot of talk um, and sort of a discussion around how we want to re rethink Pride next year. Our ED, also our executive director of Pride, Fred Lopez, he's the first uh, Latinx ED as well. So just a lot of movement, I think, um, all the way around and a lot of um, uh, possibility, I think, particularly in, in the context of this national crisis that we're facing uh, for the movement for Black Lives, as well as COVID, and then also obviously trying to overthrow Trump. And with that, I think those are going to be our, our, our closing comments very appropriately. So, um, and uh, yes, I will just thank you all. Thank you so much, Amy and Lenora, John, Jeremy, and Gerard for joining us for this quick uh, nickel tour of these three amazing exhibitions, which are available on our website, glbghistory.org, where you can also become a member again during the month of June. Uh, you can save a few bucks and join for just $35 and help to support our work um, in the coming year. Um, and with that, I just want to encourage everyone to have a fabulous, uh, wonderful pride, even if it's just with your chosen uh, pod of friends that uh, <laughs> is uh, COVID safe, appropriate for you. Um, and I know I will. And um, so happy Pride, everyone, and wash your hands. <laughs>